My name is Dale LaCure, and I am really passionate about helping families create healthier, happier, and more financially secure homes. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. There's lots of great information coming, and I will see you soon. All right. I am so pumped for this event. This information is going to rock your world. I have Dr. Sean Talbot here with me today. He's the chief science officer at the Mental Wellness Company. He's a nutritional biochemist, other things. I'm not going to go into all your credentials, but we're talking about what's going on with sleep. Like, why can't we fall asleep, stay asleep? And why is it sometimes we have the, uh, you know, the right amount of sleep, but then we wake up and we're like, don't feel good. We don't feel energetic. We don't feel like we got a good night's sleep. So thanks so much for joining me here today. And it's just going to be packed full of gold. So get your pen and papers ready. So thanks again for joining me. I know you're a busy, busy man. So take it oh, away. Oh, my pleasure. This is, a, this is a topic I love talking about too, because sleep mm -hmm. is like sleep problems are are legitimately an epidemic out there in the world, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many people who have who have a variety of problems sleeping. And we'll 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 <laughs> dig into all of them. But the, the reason it's important is because you know, if you don't get a good night's sleep, not only is it bad for your mental wellness the next day, you know, your ability to focus and think and have energy and be resilient and all that kind of stuff, but there's some real physical problems associated with not getting enough sleep. Gaining weight around your midsection, predisposing you to diabetes and heart disease and cancer. I mean, it is a big, big problem if you're not getting good quality mm. sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So let's break it down. Let's talk about why people have trouble falling asleep in the first place and what you can do during the day to maybe help you get a better sleep, fall asleep better. Yeah. That was it. Throughout the day. That was, a, that was a good way of framing that question because there's, there's, you know, first of all, there's so many ways that sleep can be problematic for somebody. You can have trouble falling asleep. You can have trouble staying asleep. You can have trouble with your overall sleep quality. And 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 all of those are going to impact how you how you feel and perform the next day. But you said it in that question, how can you use today to set yourself up for a good night of sleep? And that's really what I try to focus people on. There's a lot of things that people need to be doing during the day before they even start thinking about what am I going to do tonight to to sleep because you know that 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 there there are things like you know eat, eating the right diet can set you up for a good night or a bad night of sleep being physically active or sedentary can set you up for a good night or a bad night of sleep your exposure to uh, to electronics like what we're doing right now this is fine to do because we're doing it you know sort of in the middle of the day when the you know the brightness of the day is supposed to have us alert but if we were doing this at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, that would actually be putting us in a state where we would be likely to get a poor night of sleep. Um, yeah, exposure to sunlight during the day is a really, really vital, maybe maybe one of the most vital things that people aren't doing. If you can mm -hmm. expose yourself to good sunlight in the day and then good darkness in the evening, that can sometimes take care of a lot of the problems that people have with, with sleep. But unfortunately, where most of us are, is we're in, you know, is especially now during the quarantine, right? We're we're all inside. And when we're inside, the lightness that we're exposed to inside an office, inside a house, inside wherever you are, is sort of like it's not quite bright enough during the day. And then at night, it's not dark enough. It's too bright because we have lights on and things like that when it's dark outside. So, you know, I write about that in my book that's coming out later on this year. This idea that we're that we're we're almost um uh, like artificially putting ourselves in this uh, in this state of perpetual twilight, if you will, right? It's mm -hmm. not it's not quite bright enough for the day, mm -hmm. and it's too bright at night. And if we can switch that, and it's really easy to switch that, get outside in the daytime for at least fifteen minutes of sunlight exposure. If you can do like. I went for a run this morning for an hour and I was in the bright sunlight of Utah. That what I did exercise outside bright sun is going to set me up tonight to have a wonderful night of sleep. I love it. That's great information too, because if we can do some of those things during the day, so you mentioned diet also. So how does that, what we're eating during the day impacting how we're sleeping at night? Yeah. So, so, um, you know, one of the, so here, here, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you what I'm drinking over here on the side, right? This is a, this is an iced coffee. It's 50, 50. So it's, so it's, so it's half, half regular beans and half decaffeinated beans. So it's not a big dose of caffeine, but a lot of times people will be sipping on stimulating beverages, energy drinks and coffee and things like mm -hmm. that 
all through the day. And they might keep doing that into the afternoon. You know, they might do it at two o'clock and three o'clock and four o'clock. And for a lot of people, that caffeine has a half-life of four or five, six hours. And so if you're drinking a cup of coffee at two, like we're doing right now, and that's not getting out of your system until 8 p.m., that's something you need to be thinking of in terms of, you know, keeping you stimulated during the, you know, during the night. So, you know, mm-hmm. s- s- stimulating beverages sort of makes sense. Mm-hmm. But also if you're eating, if you're eating a diet high in processed foods, what you're ending up doing, and this might, this might get a little bit nerdy for people, but let's say you eat a lot of processed foods that is changing the bacteria in your gut into a, into it's changing your microbiome to a, a class of bacteria that is more associated with inflammation. And those bacteria can also interfere with your good night of sleep. So if you were to be able to switch your diet, even just a little bit, so you're eating fewer processed foods during the day and more whole foods, things like fresh, brightly colored, high fiber fruits and vegetables, that's gonna grow a different set of bacteria. And those bacteria will actually, instead of producing inflammatory compounds, they'll produce these compounds that that, that are called GABA. GABA is a relaxing neurotransmitter. And that for a lot of people, is the thing that is missing when they're having trouble falling asleep at night. If we can get them to have more bacteria in their gut that make GABA, then they're able to slip off into sleep a lot easier because it, you know, a lot of times the, like the, the problem that they have is they lie there in bed and their mind is going. GABA can help calm that monkey mind. And so you're really relaxed and you're able to fall asleep. It doesn't put you to sleep, but it enables you to fall asleep when you want to. And that's something that's coming from the gut. And the only way you get that is by sort of growing the right bacteria that can make that GABA on demand. So just a little bit of a side thing here. When you say whole foods, you're talking about really limiting, you know, white stuff, sugar, you know what I mean? Like that that kind of thing. That's yeah, yeah, that yeah, that. exactly. Trying to, trying to get rid of anything that's coming out of a, you know, a, out of a package ready to eat. You know, if you, if you can r- really focus on, you know, eating, you know, instead of grabbing an energy bar for a snack, right. Grab an apple, grab a banana, grab a, you know, a whole grain cracker with a piece of cheese on it. It, it just, the, 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 the less processed you can have that food and the higher fiber, higher phytonutrient content, the more likely you're going to grow those bacteria that will make the GABA. And that's going to be good for your stress levels during the day, but it's going to be particularly noticeable for your sleep quality at night. All right. So let's go a little deeper then. So we're, you're helping us, you know, prepare for the night to fall asleep, to be calm and rested so you can kind of go off to sleep. So what about those people that wake up? Like the quality of the sleep, people that are waking up multiple times throughout the night. What's happening there and what can we do to attack that? Yeah, so so it, typically falling asleep and, and, you know, that sort of initial ability to drop off is typically a GABA problem. So that's, a, you know, we talked about some ways to do that. And we can talk about later if you want to. We can talk about how you can supplement to, to encourage your body to make more GABA, to encourage your body to make more melatonin, those sorts of things. So falling asleep is typically a GABA problem. Staying asleep is typically a melatonin problem. And so we, we, there are natural ways that we can, that we can, again, get our bodies to make more melatonin on demand. So let me, let me, let me just say this before we talk about supplements, you can supplement with GABA, you know, there, you can buy a pill with, with GABA inside of it and you can take it and it will relax you and you'll fall asleep. You can, you can uh, certainly, and people know this. you can buy a pill that has melatonin in it and you can take it and it'll, it'll make you drowsy and and you'll fall asleep. Neither one of those uh, approaches, when you take it, what we call exogenously, like from the outside and you add Mm -hmm. it into your body, neither one of those seem to really give us good sleep quality. They can make us fall asleep. They can keep us asleep. They can make us drowsy. but But the architecture of what your sleep quality looks like doesn't seem to be the same good quality as when we can get our bodies to produce it on its own. And it probably has to do with the levels. It probably has to do with the way the body metabolizes 
emphasizes what it's producing on its own versus these synthetic versions that we're giving. Um, so we can, we can talk more about that later. But so knowing that, knowing that the supplementation route for GABA and melatonin isn't really the best way to go, and we know of natural ways to make our body produce more of those things mm. naturally, that's what I say to people. I go, look, there are ways we can get you to make more melatonin when you need mm. it. And so yeah. So you can. So I said bananas before, right? Bananas, cherries. Um, uh, uh, what 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 would be those are those are those are two of my sort of go tos. Oh, uh, d uh, dairy. Uh, so you know yogurt and you know things like that. Those are those are are, are sources of melatonin. They, those are foods that actually have melatonin in them. And when you eat them, your body will use that not as a direct source of melatonin, but as a reservoir to 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 sort of bleed that into the system if you need it when you need it at the right amounts. There's also mm -hmm. a supplement that we use called corn grass. Corn grass can actually be used as a building block for your body to make more melatonin when you need it. And the, and the, and the, the beauty of that is that some nights you might need more melatonin, some nights you might need less. And if you can get this into your body, then your body will make the right amount when you need it. So you never wake up with a melatonin hangover and feeling all groggy and mm -hmm. brain foggy and things like that. You wake up vibrant because you're able to go through those sleep cycles appropriately. Wow. That, that's good. Yeah. I love it when your body, you can give to your body, like get to the root of it and have your body do what it knows how to do. So let's talk about waking up and not feeling rested. Like I have yeah. some people that'll say I slept for eight hours, but I feel like I need to sleep for another eight hours. Right. Exactly. Exactly. What's going on with that? Yeah, what's going on with that is that those people are always spending time in light sleep. So if we were to draw a, 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 a sort of a, a normal sleep cycle, what you would what what you would see is that you were you, you know your body would go into deep stages of sleep and then REM stages of sleep and then light stages of sleep and then and then it, and then would cycle again. And each of those cycles get a little bit longer each each progressive cycle throughout the night. So this is why a lot of people will say oh my gosh, I get my best sleep from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. or something like that. And that's because that is the most restful sleep because those cycles are getting a little bit longer and a little bit longer each time we go through them. And so you really want to make sure you spend time in deep because that's where your body recovers. But you also mm -hmm. want to spend time in REM, which is where your brain recovers. And you can't get into REM without going through deep. So you really need to go through the whole cycles. Mm -hmm. People who wake up, you know, after being in bed for eight hours and feel like they haven't slept all night have probably spent time only in the light stages and haven't been able to go through those cycles. And that cycling, the, the, the way that we do the cycling is by enabling our body to make GABA when we need it and make melatonin when we mm. need it. And so that mm. ability to have this internal pharmacy, some of it's in the gut, some of it's in the brain, but to get that gut brain axis signaling back and forth in, a, in an optimal way, that's what is missing for so many people. And that's why these sleep problems are so epidemic. Wow. Wow. That's really, really good. So if someone is in REM sleep, like does it, if you dream a lot, does that mean that you're in REM sleep? Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a, that's a good, that's a good signal. You know, people can, people can be in REM and still not really remember their dreams. But a lot of times in the, in the research studies that we do, we actually just finished a research study on sleep in our, in our, in our laboratory here. And one of the things with this is, you know, we'll have a supplement group and we'll have a placebo group. And, you know, we as researchers don't know who's in which group and the subjects don't know who's in what group until the end of the study when we break the blinding. But one of the things that we see is that often the subjects will, will, will just know that they're in the supplement group because they start dreaming again. And they'll come to us and they'll say, you know, I don't know if this is a side effect or what, but I'm having these really vivid dreams now where I didn't before. And that's a signal to us that they weren't getting into REM before, so they weren't dreaming. And now they're getting into REM and their body's dreaming and, 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 you know, and, and, and they're able to, they'll, they're able to report on that. That's a very, very common sort of a, you know, sort of a, a side benefits, I guess, of, of, of getting good quality sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great, great. Let me just ask you again to go back to what's the best way to, to help our bodies produce this reservoir of those neurotransmitters that we need. 
What's the best way to do that? Yeah. So, so from my perspective, I'm, I'm a nutritional biochemist, right? That's what my PhD is in. So I am always a food first kind of a, kind of a scientist. I always want people to, you know, get rid of the process, get more of these whole foods, get more high fiber phytonutrient, you know, salads and fruits and vegetables and things like that so that you can feed your gut and you can feed your microbiome and you can get the right signals going across your gut brain axis. If you do that, you're going to get better sleep guaranteed and sunlight exposure in the day and dark exposure in the night and you know sort of those sorts of things right but i'm also a realist i get it that not everybody can go for a run in the morning like i did for an hour on the trails of utah mm-hmm. right I, I understand that's not a normal situation for a lot of people i also understand that especially with everything that's going on in the world right now having the perfect diet every single day and certainly every single meal is not going to be is not going to be relatable to a lot of people. That's where I think the supplementation comes in. And so we've formulated supplements that can that 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 we can feed the microbiome so that you increase your GABA production so that you're less stressed in the day and you're and you have better sleep quality. You have a better ability to fall asleep. We have formulated supplements so that you can you can get your melatonin on demand production so that tonight you might need a lot and you make a lot Tomorrow night, you might need a little and you make a little. And so it really syncs with your body. And that's what you need because mm-hmm. you should have a you should have this really nice cadence of good quality sleep, vibrant, energetic day, good quality sleep, mm-hmm. vibrant, energetic day. That should be the that should be the the the, the virtuous cycle that all of us are in every day, but because of the stressful world that we live in, a lot of people have these poor quality sleep nights and then a fatigued, irritable, stressed out day, and then a poor quality sleep and then a fatigued, irritable, stressed out day. Mm-hmm. And that's a vicious cycle that just gets worse and worse and worse unless we can come in and sort of short circuit the system and get you going back the other way. So we, you know, we've formulated probiotic products that, that work on the GABA piece and we've formulated herbal supplements that work on the melatonin piece. So is there a reason why you, like you just said, that some days you need more melatonin, some days you need less. Is there a reason that that, that would be? Does it have to do with stress levels? It could, well, it could it could do with it, it's, it's a psychological stress levels and with physical stress levels. It could be due to immune system exposure. You know, maybe you've 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 exposed yourself to some sort of a you know environmental hazard or infection or something like that, and your immune system is working overtime. The time that the immune system kind of resets itself and recharges is at night. The time when you are you are you are fixing cellular damage and tissue damage is at night. The time that your brain clears out all the toxins that have built up throughout the day, your brain actually is is, is at night. Your brain will actually shrink and grow and shrink and grow. It's like the brain is flushing itself during the night. And if you're not going through those cycles, you're not cleaning your brain. And that's lack of sleep or poor quality sleep is the number one risk factor for your, for future risk for, for dementia, for Alzheimer's, right? People, a lot of people don't realize that. And I use that as sort of a, a shocking statistic to get people to sit up and go, what? Wait a minute. I need to sleep more because I want this to be working, you know, long time into my life. So yeah, it's, it, it's, it's at night that we, that we repair all that stressful damage. And if you've, if you've had a lot, whether it's psychological or physical stress during the day, you're going to need more repair at night. And that's probably why sometimes yeah. you need more, sometimes you need less. Yeah. I love it. And I love the idea of having the reservoir in your body that your body knows I need this, I need that, and it's able to produce it. So I'm going to put um, post some of these questions in here. So from Deborah was wondering when I do get a really good night's sleep and I dream all night, but then I still feel tired during the day. Can you address that? Yeah. So, so that, that might just be that, 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 that she's not getting enough, you know? So there's, there, there's, there's, there's sort of a couple of ways that we, that we gauge sleep quality. There's total hours that you spend, right? So, you know, and everybody's heard the recommendation like, oh, you need eight hours of sleep, right? Some people need eight, some people need nine, some people need six, but typically everyone's sort of in that, in that range. So hours, quantity is one of them, Mm -hmm. but also Mm -hmm. quality is another one of them. So, you know, you might be dreaming. And so that's signaling that you're getting a good amount of REM, but maybe you didn't spend 
spend enough time in deep. And so you're feeling physically tired versus sort of mentally or psychologically tired. Um, these, are, these are all ways where, you know, you can say, you can sort of think like, oh, I think I'm getting pretty good sleep, but then you can do one of these natural interventions around, you know, gut focus to get more GABA or brain focus to get more melatonin. And then you'll wake up and go, oh my gosh, that's what I needed. I was really missing out on that kind of quality sleep. Like you can, you can really feel it when you get it. So if somebody has really good quality sleep, does that mean that they may need less sleep? Sometimes, yeah. So so when we when we measure sleep in our laboratory, we'll measure total hours, but we'll also then measure something called sleep efficiency, which is of those total hours that you're in bed, how many hours are you actually asleep? You know, so you might be in bed for eight hours, but you're only actually asleep for seven hours. Then we'll measure another thing called sleep quality which is of the time you're asleep, how much time do you spend in REM? How much time do you spend in deep? And so you could, you could have a problem with total hours that you're in bed. You could have a total, total hours of sleep that's not right, total hours of quality that's not right. So there's a lot that's going on there, but what we found is that you might only get six total hours, but if it's really good quality, that might be enough for you. You might get eight total hours, but if it's poor quality, that might not be enough for you. You know, so that's where that's where the quality I think the quality is the most important thing, especially in today's world, where if I say to somebody, you need eight hours of sleep, they go, well, I can't get that in my life. You know, my life is too hectic and I have to get up early and I have to go to bed late, you know, and I just I can't squeeze it in. It's important for you to squeeze it in. But if you can't, the next best thing you can do is make sure that whatever hours you're able to devote five hours, six hours, seven hours is as high quality as possible. Love it. All right. Here's another question. Um, thoughts on sleeping with headphones and a soothing book or podcast? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and you know this this is something I actually want to try to do some trials on. We've never looked at this before, but you know there are all these um, sort of stress management uh, uh, apps that are coming out. You know, Headspace and Calm and uh, Thrive does one where where they're starting to do bedtime stories, right? Where you know some some celebrity with a soothing voice, you know Matthew McConaughey or somebody like that, you know is 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 basically reading you a bedtime story, and so people will fall asleep with their headphones on, um, and you know maybe the music keeps going or the story keeps going. Um, I, I I don't know. Like I know that can be effective for people. I'm a huge advocate of of like white noise, you know, either having a white noise machine or an app on your phone or a fan going. Like I, I sleep with a, a little water fountain running in my room. Those can be wonderfully, wonderfully effective. Um, but I don't know. I think I think Deirdre's um, question might have been like, you know, if you if it helps you fall asleep, but then you've got the earphones still on, is that gonna <laughs> is that gonna wreck your ability to get into all those stages? I don't I don't know about that. We've never we've never studied it specifically. Is another question from Robert. What exactly is sleep apnea? Was it what does it test? Yeah. So so for a lot of people, sleep apnea is is the reason that they get such poor quality sleep. So sleep apnea basically refers to, and there's and there's several several causes for sleep apnea, is that you're you're having trouble breathing in the night and that lack of 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 that feeling of sort of suffocation wakes you up. The thing with sleep apnea, though, and the reason it's tested for is that a lot of people will wake up without even realizing it. It's they're these little micro awakenings. So, you know, you're lying down and, you know, lots of lots of reasons for this to happen. But you 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 you're not able to get oxygen. And so you feel like you're suffocating. So you wake up and you sort of you, you might cough or you might move over or something like that. And you don't even know you woke up. Some of these Sleep apnea test will show that people are waking up hundreds of times during the evening, just little tiny like microseconds. You're awake and then you're back asleep, awake, back asleep, awake, back asleep. But what that causes is an inability for you to get out of those light stages and start cycling appropriately. So those people with sleep apnea will be in bed for eight hours or nine hours or 10 hours and won't get really be getting any good quality sleep. So they'll wake up the next day and they will be exhausted. And people with sleep apnea that's that's uncorrected 
are at mm-hmm. higher risk for cancer, higher risk for diabetes, higher risk for heart attacks and strokes, higher risk for uh, for for gaining weight and you know abdominal obesity. It's really really something that needs to be needs to be fixed. And so a lot of them will go on these CPAP machines where you know it mm-hmm. forces positive pressure, it forces oxygen into your airway and keeps those airways open. Uh, there are other other solutions for it as well. But people who have sleep apnea, once they get that under control, can benefit from you know, the, the GABA and the melatonin approaches that I, that I talked about earlier. So I know, let's talk a little bit about the, the belly fat, because that's really interesting. I don't think people make that connection between poor sleep and belly fat. So put, put the dots together for us there. Yeah, it's, it's, yes, it's, the dots. It's huge. It's a huge, huge connection. And the, when the first research came out, so I wrote a book in 2002 where I wrote about some of this research. And the research had just come out of the University of Chicago at that time, but it's now been repeated at, at several universities, right? So we really know it's a true finding. But you know, back, back in those days, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a revelation, right? What they showed was People who are short sleepers, right? And a short sleeper we define as somebody who gets around six hours of sleep per night. And that that might describe a lot of people who are watching us right now compared to normal sleepers, which are people who get eight hours of good quality sleep. The short sleepers, the six hour people had 50% higher level of cortisol. That cortisol continually told their, is a stress hormone, continually told their brains the next day that they're hungry for sugar, hungry for sweets, hungry for junk food, hungry for fast food. And then when you eat those foods, they were stored around the midsection. So there was about an 18 pound difference between the short sleepers and the, and the normal sleepers, all belly fat. Right. And that that cortisol fat is almost always what it is. You know, we we call belly fat stress fat because the cortisol is so closely linked to storing fat around the midsection. But it was always driven right back to that sleep. Right. These people didn't have high stress in the day or at least they had the same stress during the day. It really was the lack of sleep that was causing them to have high cortisol cravings all the all the all the while and then belly fat accumulation. And so you know, the question then became at that time, well, if I got better sleep, would I lose weight? And what we found in those trials is that people who got better sleep, they didn't magically lose weight, but their appetite was better. Their cravings were less. Their metabolism was, be- was, was improved. Their blood sugar control was better. Everything was going in the right direction for them to lose weight if they had a good diet and exercise regimen. Wow. That's great. Again, like getting to the root, right? The root yeah, part. exactly. Here's another really good question. How about napping that? during the day? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. And the, you know, the, it's um it's a little controversial actually. There's some researchers that advocate napping uh, to sort of f- sort of fill in the gaps. You know, let's say you are that short sleeper who only gets six hours. If you've got a flexible enough schedule where you can get, you know. A 10 minute nap here and a 20 minute nap there and sort of fit, fill in that gap. There's some researchers that say that, yeah, it's better than not. And then there's other researchers that say that those naps are going to interfere with the next night's sleep. So the jury is a little bit still out. There's, there's data to support both ways. I'm more of an anti nap person because what I want people to do is sort of build up that, that, that something called sleep pressure all the way through the day, right? So if you can just keep yourself awake through the day you're, and, and, and you follow the principles that, that we've just talked about, you'll be much more predisposed to have a good quality night of sleep and then you won't need that nap the next day, right? But it's sometimes hard to get out of that cycle of the poor night and then the poor day and the poor night mm. and the poor day. You know, you got to start somewhere. And I really try to advocate to people, if you can get a good day and a good night, that's what's going to start leading to another good day and a good night and another good day and a good night. And then if you and then if you have a mess up, you know, you have a bad day or you have a bad night, just get back, get, you know, get back on the wagon and, and try to get back into those into those positive cycles. Awesome. So let's recap. So you talked talked about light and how important it is to go outside, get some light. What's your thought on blue light blocker glasses? Because my kids walk around with them. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's there's actually a natural way to do that internally. So the so the filters that are in those glasses, I actually wear transition lenses so that when I go outside, they actually get a little bit darker. So they block they block blue light and they block UV light. 
Um, but there's a way to do that inside your eyeballs if you're getting enough lutein. So, so these, these carotenoids that are in these brightly colored fruits and vegetables that I was talking about before and can be put into supplements, lutein, zeaxanthin, um, astaxanthin, uh, uh, xanthophils, you know, there's, there's a variety of them that are naturally occurring in these plant foods that if we eat more of those, or if we're not eating those and we supplement with them can actually put blue blocking at the level of your retina. So it's right there in your eyes. So that, so there's sort of two problems with blue light. It can become damaging to your eyes. So if you're sitting in front of a computer for eight hours of a day, it's, 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 it's oxidizing your eyeballs, but then there's also the signal that's going out in, into your brain that is stimulating. So the more that you can block that either naturally or sort of physically, you're going to reduce eye damage, but you're also going to reduce stimulation to the brain. The, the, the thing is we want a certain amount of that during the day, and then we want to avoid it at night. So what I'll tell people is you got to give yourself at least an hour of sort of blue light detoxification at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You got to shut off the computer. You got to put down the iPhone. You have to turn off the TV. You have to do that stuff and have at least an hour of dimness and then as, uh, as total darkness as possible when you actually go to bed. So uh, from a personal, you know, um, example, like I'll watch, I'll watch some of the late night comedians, you know, at night before I go to bed, get mm -hmm. a little laugh you know, on YouTube or something like that. But we shut, we shut off all the electronics. Our room, our bedroom is pretty dim, you know, just enough light to read a paper book. People re remember what those are, I think, right? Books, you know, that are printed on dead trees. <laughs> That's what you want to do. Don't read it on your iPad. You know, if you can get a Kindle that doesn't have a backlight to it, that, that, that would be appropriate too. But the more you can sort of ease yourself into that darkness, the, the, the better night sleep you're going to get hands down. Do you think it's important to have like a schedule where it's always the same? Like I know, and that's not really realistic either for people to wake in at the same time and go to sleep at the same time. Yeah. As much as possible, like where the, where the research is strongest on that is when people have a drastic shift between what they're doing Monday through Friday and then what they're doing on the weekends, you know, they're staying mm -hmm. up and sleeping in and all that kind of stuff. One thing we know is that is that having more of a regular sort of cadence, you, you wake up sort of the same time every day, you go to bed sort of the same time every night, that definitely helps your body to be able to slip into those sleep cycles much more, much more readily when we're off. And it's like, some nights we go to bed late. Some nights we go to bed early. Some nights we sleep in some nights we get up at the crack of dawn that that sort of disparate schedule is not good for sleep quality. So yeah, I mean, the more, the more you can do that, the better for sure. Yeah. yeah again, it's not really realistic. Um, one more question about melatonin, because I know a lot of people, they run to the stores and actually somebody was telling me, I can't remember who it was, was telling me they went to the store to look at the melatonin and the shelves were empty. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone. So let's talk about that a little bit, because that's what people think, like, go get the bottle of melatonin. Can you just go a little bit deeper into why yeah. it doesn't work for some and it does work for others? Like it's like the dosage is some people have take a ton. Some people it keeps them up like that's a yeah. really mysterious supplement. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a big fan of melatonin supplements. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, once once people hear what I have to say about melatonin, you know, they think that I'm anti melatonin and I'm, I'm not really anti, but it doesn't work for most people who use it. So melatonin is a hormone and right? people think that the melatonin on the shelf is a natural approach to getting them to sleep because our bodies naturally make it. But 100 percent of the melatonin on the shelf is a synthetic version of the melatonin that our bodies produce, all right? So let me let me, let me me disabuse anybody of thinking that they're doing something natural. They're taking a synthetic version of a hormone. The problem with that is that when we give our bodies hormones from the outside that we're taking on the inside, our body's really smart. Our body says, huh, look at all this great melatonin that's coming in. I'm gonna stop my own production of it. So if you're using melatonin on a regular basis, say every night to go to bed, your body's gonna stop making its own melatonin and then you are dependent on that external melatonin, otherwise you can't sleep, okay? So that's the first problem with it. The other problem with it is that if it works for you, congratulations, but you're only in about 
40 or 50 percent of the population that it actually works for. So, you know, what it's more likely to do is just make you feel kind of groggy the next morning because your body isn't able to metabolize through that entire mm -hmm. dose. And so you take it. It doesn't really improve your ability to sleep. And then you wake up and you're even more groggy than you than you would have been if you didn't take it. Right. So that's that's what we call the melatonin hangover. Mm -hmm. so, so there's that. If it does work for you, you're that 40 or 50% that it works for, what it does is it helps you sleep about seven minutes on average more than if you didn't supplement with it. But that extra sleep is not good quality sleep. There are zero studies that show that melatonin improves sleep quality. There are studies that show that for the people it works for, melatonin can improve sleep duration but not sleep quality. So because of all those reasons, I don't think it's a good approach for most people, especially if we can use other supplements like corn grass I mentioned before to improve your body's ability to make its own melatonin, right? So a plant version, a phytonutrient that can get your body to do what it was supposed to do in the first place, that that I think is a much, a much more you know, nuanced and natural and holistic way to do it than to take a synthetic hormone. Yeah, wow, thanks for clearing that up because I know there's a lot of people that definitely that's their first go-to and knowing that it's not natural, it's synthetic, I, I didn't even realize that actually, that's, that's amazing. So, all right, this is good stuff. Okay, from Robert again, can you see that? What's the explanation as to why you shouldn't eat meals before going to bed? So that is a good question, Robert. I actually recommend that people eat a meal before they go to bed, not a big meal, right? And so people hear me say that sometimes and they're like, oh my gosh, that's exactly opposite of what I've heard everybody tell me, you know, Oprah used to say you can't eat anything after 8 p.m. And if you do, you know, you know, the, the sky is going to fall uh, and, you know, it's, it's like people are trying to eat something at 7.59 because the clock is going to hit 8 o'clock and then we're going to turn into a pumpkin. Your metabolism doesn't work that way. And a lot of times I'll recommend that people have a little snack before they go to bed. In fact, some of the things that we talked about earlier, a banana, a yogurt, a little bit of granola, you know, some 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 cherry juice. I drink a, I drink like a chamomile tea, you know not every night, but lots of nights before I go to bed with a little, with a little snack, not a giant meal, because what a giant meal is going to do is get blood to rush to your gastrointestinal tract. Your, your gut's going to be working when it really should be quiet and sort of, sort of, you know, in a, in a transitory state. Um, you don't want to be doing a lot of that working and digesting and transporting nutrients and things like that. Your body really should be at rest. But if you have a little snack, the advantage of that is that it can keep your blood sugar levels normalized through the night. Dropping blood sugar is one of the things that will very often wake somebody up. If your blood sugar drops at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., you're going to wake up because that drop in blood sugar sends an alarm mm. to your brain and you wake up and you don't know why you're awake. You don't feel hungry. It's not like you woke up and said, I'm going to run down to the kitchen and get a midnight snack. You just wake up and you feel a little bit tense and a little bit anxious and you might have a little bit of a racing heart. That's a blood sugar drop. And so if you have that little snack before you go to bed, that can prevent that so that you don't have it until you until you wake up in the morning and you're ready for breakfast. So should that snack be because you said banana, but I know bananas are very high glycemic fruit food. So should you have. There must be something else in bananas that you're saying that, but should you have like a protein? Yeah, that's and that's horrible. Yeah, and that's and that's what I recommend is that you know if somebody's going to have a carbohydrate source like that, they're going to match it with a protein or a fat. So mm -hmm. you know, matching a banana would be you know some peanut butter. Matching a yogurt would be some granola. Matching a you know some some whole wheat crackers would be you know some some lovely fatty cheese or something like that. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I put recommendations like this up on my blog. I put them in all of my books, you know, so people have ideas for like, all right, what's a healthy snack that I can eat? That's not a bowl of cocoa puffs or something like that, you know? Right. Right. I love it. But this is a really good question too. And Omar is asking, 
what's the influence of improving your gut brain connection to enhance your sleep quality? Yeah. So this is, this is something that is really, really cutting edge research. So we've known for a little while now that w- w- if you're stressed out in your brain, that can change what's going on in your gut. It can change your gut motility. It can change your gut integrity. It can change the, actually what grows in the gut in terms of your microbiome. So we've known that for a while, that there was this one way street from your brain to your gut. Problems in your brain leads to problems in your second brain, your gut. What we've learned over the last couple of years is that problems in the gut, changes in your microbiome specifically, can lead to changes in your brain that can either help you sleep or, 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 or interfere with sleep. Unfortunately, the science isn't quite to the place where we can say, here's the perfect microbiome that we need for good quality sleep all the time. We know a little bit about it. And so we've talked about one of those. If we can grow specific bacteria like bifidobacterium in your gut that make GABA as one of their metabolic byproducts, that can help us fall asleep. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is that we know that the microbiome can be a buffer against stress hormones like cortisol. So there are specific strains of bacteria that we can give as a, as a supplement, as a probiotic supplement that will both increase GABA production and lower cortisol production at the same time. So those specific strains of bacteria give you a double whammy. They, they, they buffer against the thing that's keeping you awake, the cortisol, and then they give you something that's helping you fall asleep, the GABA. And so that could, I mean, that could be considered a sleep inducing kind of a, kind of a, a, a bacteria. And so we can give that to people during the day to reduce their stress, but we can also have them take a scoop of it before they go to bed as a way to help them fall asleep faster. Wow. And those are really targeted probiotics and prebiotics. Very targeted. Yeah. So that's one thing that is, that's really, really important. It's not like any old probiotic is going to do that. It, they, 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 if there's one thing we've learned over the last five years, it's this, it's this, it's this sort of theory of, um, it's not a theory. It's a, it's a, it's a strong scientific principle of, of probiotic specificity, strain specificity. So mm. specific strains do specific benefits. So the one that I was just referring to, if I can think of what the what the strain designation is. It's a, it's a, it's a lactobacillus rhamnosus 11. And so, so, so this is, this, this is interesting. And I'm just going to say this, it's a little nerdy, but it's a lactobacillus yeah. species. The strain is 11. There are, there are other lactobacillus rhamnosus GG helps with traveler's diarrhea. Lactobacillus rhamnosus uh, GR1 helps with yeast infections. The one that I just said, lactobacillus rhamnosus 11, R0011, helps with cortisol and GABA. You know, so very, very different benefits of something that looks pretty similar, but they're genetically different and they're metabolically different enough where we can say, this is the one that you want if you want low stress in the day and good quality sleep at night. Wow, that's great. It really is. It makes a difference. Like you, you can't just go to the store and pick out any probiotic. It's right. got to be specific to what you're looking to accomplish. So, right, exactly. so I know that you formulated, you know, the world's best <laughs> production of three specific probiotics, right? So how in the fundamentals that we talk about and that a lot of people are using, um, we're seeing so many benefits in terms of stress and sleep. Can you just give us a little bit more as far as like the combination of those three specific strains and how they work together and how they help us for our overall, you know, immune system function, stress resilience and sleep. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, so that pack of products that you're talking about is called, is called the fundamentals pack. In fact, you can probably, you can probably see them over my shoulder over there on my, on my shelf. Um, when we, we did some research around that in 2017, we launched the kit in 2018. And in 2018, when it launched, it was named, it, it, it won this award called the Nutra Award, which is given every year to the product that is the best finished product across the entire natural products industry, right? So when you say that it's the, it's the best that's out there, that's not just you and I saying it's the best. It's the, it's the nutraceutical industry saying it's the best. So it has good science. It has, it has the right strains. It has, it has good clinical evidence around it, but what it does is it really tries to consider the gut brain axis as this coordinated system. So it doesn't look just at the microbiome or at the immune system or at your neurotransmitters in your brain. It looks at 
all of that together as this coordinated signaling system. And that we, see, we, we, we find is really, really what's important is to, con- if we can consider it as a whole system where your stress doesn't just stay here in your brain, it goes to your gut. And what you eat doesn't just stay in your gut, it emanates mm. out into every tissue in your body. So the more we can think of it as this holistic, comprehensive system and really try to address it and say, this is what we need to do at the microbiome level. This is what we need to do at the level of your gut integrity. This is what we need to do at the level of your brain and your neurotransmitters and your memory centers. This is what we need to do in your axis, which is your inflammation and your immune system and et cetera, et cetera. If we can get all of those coordinated so that they're speaking the same language and sending the right signals, that's when people say, oh, I'm more resilient in the day. I'm more energetic. I'm more focused. And then at night, I'm more relaxed. I'm more even keel. I'm able to get good quality. And then you wake up and you're able to repeat that whole cycle again. And that's that's where people want to be. But there's so many people who are on the opposite side of that, where they're fatigued and brain fog and stressed out. And then they're tense and irritable and they can't relax mm-hmm. You know, it, we're, we're really trying to flip that whole system and you can't do it by focusing on one of those. You really have to look at it as this whole system. And that's, and that's what we did with the fundamentals. That's amazing. Wow. That was great. So comment fundamentals, if you want to learn more about it, because it really has been clinically studied and there is proof that it is doing what we say it's supposed to do, right? Incredible. Right. So, Dr. Sean, I know you've t- I've taken so much of your time. I wanted to do this like 20, 30 minutes, but it's so interesting. And <laughs> there were so many great questions that came in. All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay. My pleasure. Have an amazing rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, thank you, you too. So much.